Our next speaker is Dr. John Lane. John is still an active reservist, enlisted as a soldier in the Army in 1989. After working as a soldier for 10 years in 19, or 2013, he was deployed to the Middle East area of operations, working with the US mental health team at the NATO medical unit in Kandahar, Afghanistan, as the first ADF psychiatrist to be directly embedded with US forces. He is now completing a PhD in peer-led group treatments for serving personnel through the Center for Traumatic Stress Studies at the University of Adelaide in partnership with The Road Home and Mates for Mates. Please welcome Dr. John Lane. What I'm going to be talking about today is research based on a program that I picked up um, in the States in 2015 on a Churchill Fellowship. And the reason for, for developing this whole sort of process was simply that as a clinician, I had so many people coming to me with operational stress injuries and various other problems that I would then have to manage as an individual from start to finish. And the driving sort of force for change here was actually the fact that, you know, we were in Australia, we're very poor at managing the general sort of functioning, I suppose, of, indi of individuals. And what we tend to focus on is pathology. And we try and treat the pathology, but actually forget the person that has the patho pathology. And then there's further issues, and, and you know, with clinicians particularly, one of the barriers to accessing care is the cultural competence of those clinicians. And so, as a clinician, for example, me having had 30 years in the army, and, and you know, been a digger for 10 years, and then became an officer and, and a doc, general duties doc, and then doing psychiatry and whatever else, there was a fairly deep and intimate level of understanding of what people go through. And so I refer to myself as a peer clinician in that sense because of my experience. And the cultural competency is so important because you have to understand what it's like to have been there, done that. You know, and the, the people that I've had in EMFS um, and SAPOL, Matt, you heard before, you know, in, in many ways, it's the same shit with a different smell, yeah? Because we've all been there, done that, and it's something so similar. But that's the cultural competence aspects that I'm really talking about here. And so this sort of um, program that came back was initially supported by Mates for Mates, and um, I ran a program in 2016 in Hobart, and then Suzanne, I don't know if you're here, nope, but Suzanne DeSalle, the general manager from Mates for Mates, was then picked up and they've been running it at Hobart, Brisbane and Townsville. But I decided to do a PhD to evaluate it formally, and this is where I have immense gratitude to The Road Home, because they've provided me some funding in order to be able to do this properly. And then my program is through the Centre for Traumatic Stress Studies, and Miranda, <laughs> can't tell you how much I'm so grateful to have you as a supervisor, along with Ellie and then Sandy McFarlane. But this sort of a team approach has allowed us to develop this further. And the reason I'm focusing on peers is because, you know, simple life experience tells me that as a group, we are so defined by our occupation. Yeah? That becomes our identity in that sense of the psychodynamic perspective. And so what we need to start looking at is where are people going to go? They're going to go to their mates first. Yeah? But what's the difference between me, you know, going out with a mate and having a beer versus having a peer support worker? And this is where I sort of ran into difficulties because the definition of peer and peer workers uh, is, let's just say, it's a moving feast. And we don't necessarily have um, an idea on what we want people to do. And so, you know, peers and, and peer support workers are used in a whole range of areas. And it's really important that they're engaged because you can't have siloed treatments and having interdisciplinary models is just so fundamentally important because people present as complex patients as you've seen from the previous presenters and so what we need to do is go how are we going to identify those people and then how are we actually going to use them to engage with to access and then engage with the treatment services so what can peer support do and by peer support i'm, I'm not making a you know, a specific statement on scope and responsibilities, but these are the sorts of things that we can talk about doing. And the key factors here is that what you're doing is you're using those interpersonal relationships that people have with their peers, with their colleagues, to improve their access to and maintain their engagement with services in order to build 
and enhance recovery. There's a huge amount of modelling that goes on here too and you can't underscore that because what we do again by engaging with our colleagues is we model functioning and recovery. And so again, that needs to be utilised at that base interpersonal level. Engagement during the transition process <coughs> and later is so important because again, you know, we haven't really talked about identity changes again in the psychodynamic um, sort of sense when people are involuntary discharged. Yeah, so, so that transition is forced upon a person. And so because it's forced on them, they lose that sense of efficacy, mastery and control over what happens to them in the future. And how do we manage those changes? Well, in Australia, unfortunately, we don't very well at all. So by utilising peers, we can start to talk about a more positive psychological model of growth after trauma and after chronic stress. And what we're doing here is engaging the values of those people and actually giving them an avenue to express them, to engage with them and to benefit, to give back to the community. Because this is what people want to do in service cultures. When you think of the word service occupation, it is to serve. Regardless of whether you're a smoky, whether you're a cop, whether you're a soldier or whatever you are, to serve is what it's all about. It doesn't stop just because you take the uniform off at night. So, you know, engaging peers again means that we can actually maintain that organisational capital and experience even though someone might not be capable of full-time operational duties. And so how are we actually going to do that? How are we going to have a model of growth where we can use people for an organisation or as adjunctive providers within a healthcare organisation? and hence the need to develop this paraprofessional model of peer counsellors so we can actually have a scope of practice with appropriate responsibilities, authorities, lines of command and communication and so on. It was so important to me to develop this in the emergency and first responders space because organisations need to have the capacity for this as well as healthcare organisations as well because again, same shit, different smell. It happens to all of us just at different times, places and to degrees. So how can we do these sorts of things? Well, a range of different ways. So it can be done in person, as we've been doing with face-to-face -face groups, but also remotely by telehealth as well too. So a lot of the groups that I've been running have been with me being based in my hometown of Hobart and then you know, using Zoom as a means of delivering group interventions. But again, as you saw from Stephen's slide, we're talking about complex conditions and when you're talking about complex conditions and you're talking about people that have had those complex conditions as well, you need to have a, a complex and inter interdisciplinary health service that can actually manage those individuals. And so hence the need for an operational framework that incorporates both peers, their mentors, their supervisors and so on in order to continue for people to be able to access and then maintain their engagement with them as they're getting better. And there's a whole bunch of different um, historical guides. Well, I want to say a whole bunch, I'm talking three, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> because again, lots of people talk about this sort of stuff, but how it's operationalised is something different again. And um, uh, hats off to, to the um, Defence Centre of Excellence who developed an initial um, identification of best practice paper in 2011. It was also uh, followed by the Australian Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, um, Phoenix, who produced a similar sort of paper. But then the most recent that I've been able to come across, which was amazing, was released at the end of last year, and this was the Invisible Wounds Initiative Peer Support Kit. And when they say kit, they're talking about a whole range of services that peers can be used to um, deliver during, you know, a peer-led program at a range of different levels. So, talking about myself and, and, and my research program raised a whole bunch of particular questions because, you know, if we're going to have a peer workforce, what are they actually going to do? Yep, is it, you know, catch up and have a coffee? Is it say, g'day mate, how are you going? But then when someone says, oh geez, I'm shit house, oh, now what do I do? Yeah, so what are we actually going to have? And so. There's a, there's a distinct need for what peer support is going to consist of. So operationally, what are you going to do if you're a peer support 
person versus a peer worker versus a peer counsellor versus a peer mentor. And so having those sorts of standardised roles and, you know, scope of practice and responsibilities, lines of command, and in particular corporate and clinical governance. Because one of the biggest issues with, with peers is not just their own um, health, but their tendency to overreach and put themselves at risk and damage themselves further because of their desire to help. So how do we then protect those individuals in that role? And how do we protect the organisations that those people are working for as well too? And so we're talking about risk and managing reputation here, but we're also talking about managing the health of the individuals who are peer supporters and who those peer supporters are engaging with. So, you know, things like boundaries are so important. Confidentiality is so important. But having clear policies for role and scope of practice <coughs> is so, so important. And if you don't have those governance structures in place, it's not going to work and it's not going to be sustainable over the longer term. The problem we have in Australia particularly is funding, yeah? And if you don't have a service that's funded, then it's not going to maintain. Uh, th there's no sustainability because people will burn out and fall over. It's just, it's not going to work. And that's one of the key issues we're still struggling with. So the program I was talking about initially was the STAIR program, so Skills Training and Affective and Interpersonal Regulation. And so uh, this has been used to a degree in a one-on-one -on -one, um, environment within the US and in the Veterans Affairs System. And it's been used basically as a precursor for narrative therapy. And we're talking here about generalised skills-based interventions. And so by generalised, I mean it's not necessarily trauma-specific. It can be used for any you know, particular diagnosis you can talk about because it is transdiagnostic by nature. And from Stephen's earlier slides, we're talking about the initial stabilisation phases here. Um, 18 hours over 12 weeks, so 12 90-minute sessions once a week. Um, and as I had said earlier, the, you know, this has been running Hobart initially 2016, but then from 2018 onwards, been running groups here in Adelaide for military veterans, police, fire brigade, had a correctional services officer, um, and some frontline health staff as well too. Uh, this program we've, we've finished now, and we're transitioning to um, a, a slightly different program, or a somewhat different program that I've developed because of the experience of running 100 odd people through the STAIR programs to a program I'm calling GEARS, which is Group Emotional uh, Regulation and, um, sorry, <laughs> Group Emotional and Relationship Skills. Yeah. So the first six weeks are really focused on that individual um, uh, emotional regulation stuff, but also on identity. And, and again, identity in the psychodynamic you know, sense of the word, because Identity is so fundamentally important to service occupations and if you don't um, educate people on that and help them work through their identity issues during those stages of crisis and transition, then you know, you're really going to be quite, quite stuck. Also, a, a huge amount of psychoeducation on not just the traumatic conditions, but on the conditioning that we have within service occupations to put everyone else first, ourselves last. And, you know, in terms of how we manage stress and distress by basically compartmentalising it, putting it in a bucket because the job comes first. And so, again, I talk about sort of functional interventions and that's what this is because you have to be able to understand how you function in order to our bit to be able to improve your function. And so, you know, a grab bag of, of general psychological tools are used through the first six weeks and then through the first, the next six weeks, which is about those interpersonal relationships. Because, you know, none of us exist as individuals within society. We have to have relationships. And we know that the protective factors that predict a positive recovery are close, supportive relationships. You know, intimate relationships, families, friends, colleagues, and so on and so on. And so hence that sort of division of two separate sections. The thing with the program though is it's only ever run in a group format. And the group format is so important because again, it normalizes, um, it normalizes typical maladaptive uh, stress reactions and inappropriate coping behaviors, but then it normalizes and models um, acceptance of that 
recognises that this is what's happened, but now this, these are things that we can do differently, and then models that through the change. And again, that group format is so fundamentally important because it's culturally how we operate. You know, as a serviceman, I, I don't work, well, I do as a doc, I work by myself to a degree, but I'm always part of a team. And every member of any service organisation is always part of a team. And so we're used to operating within groups and, and that's how it should be. And so basically, what I wanted to do was develop, you know, peer counsellors to deliver these skills-based interventions so that as a clinician, I could have people coming to me who've already been stabilised. They are relatively functional. They do have the capacity to understand what's happened to them and actually engage in treatment and benefit from it. And as Stephen said before, you know, I spend far, far, far more of my time taking people off medications than I do on putting them on medications. And again, I have never cured anyone with any drug in PTSD. Yes, I've saved lives, but, you know, again, what I tell people is, I cannot give you a pill for this condition, full stop, end of story. If you come to me asking for the magic pill, I'm going to have to turn around to you and say, mate, it comes in the form of a lot of hard work. And again, referring people back to the training, the, the, the skills-based interventions so that they can be functional, so they can benefit from the treatment that, that I'm using. This, when we're talking about a paraprofessional workforce for peers though, it gets somewhat more difficult because again, for sustainability, you actually have to have levels of accreditation. And so again, you know, need to have that process whereby you recruit, select, train, and then supervise people in an appropriate way in order to have that functional skills-based intervention as a part of your organisation or your healthcare practice. And it's gonna take at least 12 months for people to go through that process. I'm lucky that I've had a couple. Matt Newlands, who was up on the stage here before, is my first um, ex-police man. Uh, but I've also got Sharon Maskell there, who's sitting in the back of the room as the first peer counsellor. And I wanted a woman specifically because women's issues are different from men's. And again, you know, we look at this concept of stress and stress injuries, whether it's PTSD or whatever else, and it's complex and it's not homogenous in any way, shape or form. And so hence the need to have women's counsellors and women's specific issues being able to be raised. Um, you know, again, this is the dream, <laughs> but to have that integration of appropriately trained um, counsellors who have an intervention they can deliver at the coalface for stability so that people can then go into treatment later on and benefit from it. And, you know, the results are being presented at the end of this month at the Society for Mental Health Research um, uh, conference, but again, significant changes in anger. So using the dimensions of anger scale, you know, significant pre-post differences, and then same for depression with the PHQ-9, with anxiety for the GAD-7, and then with PTSD using the PCL-5 scale. And so what we're seeing here is that providing functional skills-based interventions helps people tolerate distress significantly more. So they still might be symptomatic, but they're not distressed by, that, by those symptoms that they're having, and they're able to be significantly more functional going on with their lives. And that's the goal. And so again, the, the program, uh, train the trainer type model, adult education, just about out of time here, so. But, you know, using, so the challenges here are obviously that, you know, we're talking quite, uh, you know, significantly serious, I suppose, psychological knowledge required to deliver these sorts of interventions, which has required um, a lot of work for me to develop the manuals and to explain the different forms of interventions, what they mean, how they work, and that sort of stuff, so they can be delivered by people without psychology degrees but they do need to have some standard of accreditation and hence we're using a diploma of counselling as, as the base standard for that. But again, very practical training using peer counsellors so that they do the program first, they then observe a program and then they can start to co-facilitate co under direct supervision. And this can be by myself or by psychologists within organisations or by psychologists within the health facilities that are actually using the program as well too. And again, you need that because that gives you the clinical governance perspective and again having you know the program as an intervention gives you another scope of practice means of um, you know being able to manage what happens within the organization
we have a range of uh, people going through this process now and next year the clinical trial for GEARS is kicking off and we should have about, oh, we've got five, six people in training, um, a couple of different counsellors already accredited and then Mates for Mates have formally identified and engaged um, counsellors and have them going through their training process as well. So it is slowly picking up but again for sustainability, you need to have that level of training and education and so by definition it is a slow process because you are training a workforce. Outcomes, as you'd expect, um, quite positive from the peers themselves because it's allowing for that post-traumatic growth and it's allowing for all those individual values to be put into action to help the community and help other people as well. So in summary, scope of practice, scope of practice, Clinical governance, clinical governance. <laughs> That's what we're really sort of looking for. But having you know a specific intervention that can be used to help stabilise at an early stage and then be used as a part of the treatment process. But having it delivered by people with that lived experience who have the capacity to understand what's going on because of that life experience. So fundamentally important, saves so much time and so much you know, screwing around within sessions and that sort of stuff. And then having people who've been through this process then being able to engage in whatever treatment is appropriate for them and have it so much more effective because they've got all this functional stabilisation stuff already down pat. So thank you very much, folks. Really appreciate your time and attention. <laughs>